Hello, welcome to Community of Writers. My name is Justin Kitts, and I'll be your host today. Uh, my guest today is named Anthony Sovak. He was born and raised in New York's Lower Hudson Valley. He holds a PhD in English from Stony Brook University and is currently a full-time faculty professor at the um, Pima Community College in Tucson, Arizona. He's also head of the Pima Online Department of English and Communication and has recently returned from a sabbatical where he focused on writing new work and explored the uh, publishing market. Allow me to introduce my friend, my teacher, and my guest, Professor Anthony Sovak. Welcome. Hey, buddy. Thanks. Now, you brought some poems in. Uh, I'm anxious to hear, but uh, first I'd like to hear a little bit about your sabbatical. What prompted it? What was your focus during it? And uh, what, if anything, did you take away from it? Oh, good question. Well, uh, we're really fortunate here at Pima Community College to have uh, the professional development opportunity for sabbaticals. Um, and so what prompted it was... Uh, it's there, you know, and it's just a really cool program where you uh, propose a professional development opportunity that's generally like outside of related to what you do and valuable to the college and the students, but outside, you know, your day to day stuff. And as a department head of online, I do a lot of online stuff. I do online creative writing classes as well. Um, but uh, I used it as an opportunity to really um, get back into my craft as a poet and to take a look at um, take a look at, you know, what it'd be like to try and get poems out there. I've written poems a, a long time, but I'd, I've never really tried to get them published. And, and it's one of the things my students ask me about, but I wasn't able to answer adequately. I'd always be sending them somewhere else. And so uh, the nature of the project was to write poems and try to get them published essentially, um, and then to reflect on the process and, and to guide, to create a guide for others to do it. Um, what I learned is, uh, I don't know, all kinds of things, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. I've got two rejection letters out of five that I've sent so far. So, um, uh, but I'm actually not sad about that. I feel really yeah. good that I'm getting letters because it means I sent something out and right. <laughs> yeah, yeah it means you got uh, out there. I'm good. I'm good with it. You know, and no one's been really mean about it. They've said, Hey, you know, not, not yet, you know, keep sending us stuff. I was like, Oh, I like that. Cool. Um, right on. And, uh, now I we're approaching the end of October. It's kind of our Halloween episode, I guess. I see you brought a pumpkin. I brought a pumpkin. I like that. <laughs> and uh, I, I know you have a, uh, a Halloween poem. I was wondering if you would mind sharing that with us. Today. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little background on it first. Sure. Uh, it's called uh, Off Rose Hollow. And um, in, when I was in New York getting that PhD uh, at Stony Brook University, I had a friend of mine who um, actually teaches mythology classes with us now. Uh, but he... Uh, he was well into haunted places and mythologies and, and of folklore and things like that. And uh, one of the, the supposedly this road uh, was haunted and was called Broad Hollow Road, but I always remembered it differently. So when I, when I went to write the poem, I wrote it as Rose Hollow Road. Um, and so supposedly when you drive it, you know, if you ever hear those myths where, you know, like a, a cop will stop you and then he'll go to take your license and the back of his head will be gone. Right. Or, or the, someone the engine will just stop all of a sudden. On the right. Yeah. Yeah. Road. Or like yeah. someone, you know, the engine will stop and then someone, someone will jump off a bridge and you'll get out of your car sure. and there's no one there. So this is like all of those myths <laughs> on oh, this wow. road. Um, but I, my, my poem doesn't have too much to do with that. Um, and in fact, actually, if we're looking at it now, I see a cool that we are, um, as I started revising, I started playing with a lot of the space, um, but the original, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to scroll because it's a Mac, but <laughs> the original up here, it's very, mm. very traditional looking. And then um, uh, Charles Alexander uh, is a local publisher. He, you know, he's been, he was on the first episode yeah. uh, of this show and he really encouraged me to play with space. So this is what we got. Very cool. Off Rose Hollow. On All Hollows Eve, dressed as cheap demons, we sweep through the streets, creep door to door like Jesus freaks, and deplete the peace when we speak the speech and scream that archaic ransom demand with tiny, outstretched hands. But what do we know of fears, of tears, of unrelenting laments appear year after year after year after? We see. Three streets east off Rose Hollow Road. Gardens used to grow. Headstones now, row after row, sown here and there with weeping trees awoke from bleeding seeds, shading the curtain sleep of imperfect sheep. Curiously, 
The wind blows stringy leaves with a merciless, furious, persecuting breeze. But the earth is silent, a versatile curse. She sits perfectly at ease. <laughs> That's great. Thank Thanks, you. man. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, now, one thing I'm always kind of curious about when I meet fellow writers or, or I meet poets is what's your ideal writing atmosphere? I know you went on sabbatical. Uh, do you have a private place that you go to? Uh, do you carry a journal with you? Do you write on the go? Uh, do you have a favorite beverage with you? Coffee, a scotch? Do you have to read page 42 of Catcher in the Rye? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, paint me a picture. What, what's the scene like when, when you sit down to write or, or is it on the move? Um, what's the Sobek method look like? Well, you know, uh, I do take a lot of notes. Um, and you'll notice this in, in when we're in class and someone mm -hmm. says something and I'm like, just, you know, snippets of words, I'll just throw it down in a journal. Um, and eventually I'll want to turn that into longer lines. Um, but uh, I don't have a lot of luck writing poetry in public. Um, I, I used to write a lot of my dissertation when I was writing that. I would go to Starbucks a lot, in part because, you know, either I had a cubicle or, you know, I didn't have an office, so there was really no space. So I'm used to doing that kind of writing, you know, and I and I did I did uh, a lot of writing, I, so like academic, worky stuff I can do in a coffee shop. Uh, but poetry, I just look like a crazy person because <laughs> <laughs> because I, I it's spoken to me, and so the only way I can revise it is to recite it. Sure. And if I'm in public, it just, it looks like... And then, you know, I'm, I'm either I'm not I don't have a headset in because I can't listen to my words. And, and so and then the noise is pretty distracting. So typically it looks like me locked in um, a room in my house with a fan blowing on me, because if if I let the cats in, then I have cats in my lap. So I really do need kind of the quiet. Um, and it's just me talking it over and over and over again um, to get the lines going. And sometimes I'll print them out, you know, old school and, and just hit them up on the go, that kind of thing I can yeah. do. But yeah, it's coffee all day though. Coffee all day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Same here. <laughs> um, now would you, do you, uh, you have another poem with you that would you mind reading? Oh one, man, I wrote one? so many. Yeah. Okay. All absolutely. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, if, if before you start, maybe like you did with the other one, tell us just a little bit about where it comes from, where your headspace was when, before you're writing it or yeah. during writing well, it. Well, this one, uh, this one's great because one of the guys who works here uh, in the TV studio gave me one of these lines. Um, and it, you know, a lot of times, like I said, my process is finding, finding words and, and lines out there and other people have said and just kind of appropriating them for the purposes of poetry. And this was, um, I picked this one because it's a, a kind of like a quintessential Tucson poem, I think. Um, and I can explain a little bit more about that after, I guess. Okay, sure. Um, but we started, I, it, it, I wrote this based on experience after interviewing two people, T.C. Tolbert and Kristen Nelson at, at a, for the community of writers. Yeah, I just watched those. Actually. And, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, some other friends, their words made it in, and it was just kind of processing this thing that I saw while I was driving um, that just didn't make any sense to me. You okay. Know? Um, and I guess the way to say it is that, there are people in Tucson who this makes all of the sense in the world to them and other people who it's just, they don't get it. They see it senseless, you know? So, uh, and that's what, that's what it is about a problem. Okay. Problems. I met beautiful people this morning who said, use your heart, write your heart and your poem becomes a recording of your presence in the world. We have an audio problem. We need to start from the top. Unexpectedly, the white pickup in front of me swerves to the left to run over a rattlesnake out for a morning sunbath on the hot desert road. The snake wiggles in the air, one last spastic dance, then bleeds out on the asphalt. The driver nods, don't thank me, pay it forward. <laughs> That's great. So, you so, know, I, I like I could tell that he did it because he had to go out of his way to run over the snake. Right. And it was intentional. Him, yeah. He was like this. I have saved somebody from a snake bite. You're welcome. You know, right. Like, right. <laughs> and maybe he's right. I could be wrong. Yeah. You, you, you never know. Um, That's a great poem. Thank you. Um, have you always considered yourself a poet? Uh, No. No? No. And uh, when, when did your love of poetry start or? Or is that different than the time that you considered yourself a poet? Did you did you love poetry before? 
You, you, you yeah. consider yourself a poet? Yeah, I mean, I've always I've always written poetry, but I don't never I I, I didn't always think of myself as a poet. The, uh, you know, because I thought that there were heirs to that mm. that there just aren't. You know, it's a it's a mythology. You know, every, yeah. everybody's a poet, and it might be like um, I was talking. I was doing a video before I came here for my online lit American poetry class, talking about Emerson. Uh, his essay, the the poet, you know, where he says uh, the poet is representative. Stand, he stands uh, among partial men for the complete man, and it was this, I mean, it's very problematic, yeah, you know, notion that you know there is one truth and that it radiates from this one person. Um, and so, while I always enjoyed poetry, uh, I also don't, I, I don't think that I, I don't know, I didn't, I guess that. The, you know, I never really worked that hard on my writing career. Mm. It was part of the reason that I took some time off for the sabbatical is to kind of foster that a little bit. Um, and I think really it was just a way of not wanting to get hurt by getting rejected sure. <laughs> from poems. You yeah. Know, you know, I had my poetry get rejected and, and it seemed like a, a tough process. So um, I did adapt a new strategy wherein I actually send my poems out as Tony. <laughs> And oh, not right. Anthony. So when they reply, they say, Tony, we don't like your poems. And Tony's tough. He's from New York. He's yeah. like, he doesn't care. He's Put like, that right. little barrier right there. I don't there. care if you don't like my poems. Sure. You know? <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. I, uh, I do something similar <laughs> with my art. I, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, I've talked about this in class too, but that, that uh, creation of uh, the artistic persona or this uh, performance persona, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and Tony, Tony's okay. You know, you can reject his poems. It's fine. He's, sure. He's, he's okay with that. You know, that yeah, makes sense. It makes sense to put that little barrier there so you don't get the, that, that crush from rejection like that. that. But that's, that's good. Um, so when did you start writing? How, how old were you when you started, started writing or really got into it, I guess? I don't know, man. I think the first time I can, I mean, I, I remember writing this short story. It was along the lines of like Shel Silverstein where like you travel to a different world or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was, everyone was really proud of it. I was like, I don't know, I want to say fifth grade because I used yeah. all the adjectives I could find to describe things. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I remember that and I remember writing things like for Christmas story contests or something. I would... You know, there was a, I was a, at the word processor because that's what we were doing back then, uh, typing away for, to meet a deadline for some local uh, Christmas story thing. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I've been writing. I wrote in high school. I, I spent a lot of time writing poetry, and I ended up uh, doing a vanity publisher at the time. And so I have a, a it's like the, the lost Sovac poems. Only some people have this. It's very elite. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a, like a book of 30 or something, uh, mostly rhyming couplet poems that uh, that looked very impressive for a high school student to have, sure. you know, um, and and I liked it. And for what it was worth, it was good, you so, know. So a career in writing has always been, sounds like it's always been in the cards for you, whether you consider yourself a poet at, at that time or, or not. It sounds like you've always had a passion for it. Um, yeah, correct. Very yeah, age. yeah. I mean, the whole idea was that I would I would write and then I would become a teacher and then have time to write. And so, <laughs> so the sabbatical was sort of like a fulfillment of that process, yeah, I think, in a way. Definitely. Um, and what's kind of what's kind of rad about it is I think the, my, my best takeaway from it is um, just like. You know, and this might be a good leading because you wanted. I know you wanted to ask me about this, but uh, just like if you go to the gym mm -hmm. and you want to get big and strong, like they say, everyone wants to be strong. Nobody wants to lift weights, right? Right. Well, the way you go lift weights is you get a buddy who wants to do it, and then you're accountable to that person. Sure. And so the same thing is true in education and and writing poetry. And so I have a couple buddies who I will say, hey, you know, I really need to write some poetry. Let's go do it, and you know, we'll meet up at Whole Foods or a coffee yeah. shop and. Um, you know, either start working on something or we'll go to, go to my house and, you know, just hang out back in the nerd room and, you know, get some poetry writing done. So I haven't, I was, uh, I was going to ask you about that, but you just mentioned that, um, now you do some com competitive power lifting too. I, when I was doing research, I, I happened upon that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you're a poet, you do competitive power lifting. I'm the poet uh, Hulk. It's a very, it's a very superhero Clark Kent kind of thing you, you got going on here. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, for what it's worth, I'm the small guy and uh, I'm re relatively new to it. Um, and, uh, 
Uh, but yeah, no, I was, I've was i been powerlifting. I've been to two competitions so far, and I was going to do another one uh, in Yuma next month. Um, but I ended up hurting my bicep because mm. I didn't follow safety protocol. So kids, if you're out there, <laughs> there are reasons. I have a video of it. It's uh, it's disturbing. Um, but yeah, no, and I, and what was cool is I, I got some state records. You know. Um, yeah, I think I read it's up there close close to 500 pounds. Is that what I was uh, reading, or is it? It's pretty. It's yeah, pretty I mean, hefty. It, it for the be, for the for the squat. Yeah, it was yeah. close to that. Uh, I, I mean, my, my gym record is 530. But, oh, wow. Um, that's uh, not the same as doing it at the oh, competition, right. but that's a, that's cool. That's a lot of weight. It's hard <laughs> to imagine you being the small I'm guy. The small guy. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so I, I'd, like to, I'd like to end with a poem, but be, be, before that, um, I'd like to know if you have any advice for, for struggling writers, people, people that might not feel like they're a poet yet, um, or people that just have writer's block. I mean, because that's a very real thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's like uh, three questions there. I don't know if oh. I got one answer for all of them. But <laughs> <laughs> so, what advice do you have to, to people that might not consider them poets, but they enjoy writing poetry um, for uh, being more comfortable in their skin? With that? You can call yourself whatever you want. You know, just do what you like. You know, I was, I think I, I, um, I struggled to write because I didn't think of myself as a poet. So, if you're not writing because you don't think you're a poet. And that's the problem, right? Mm. But if you're writing and you just don't want to call yourself a poet, uh, you know, that's fine too. Um, right. But we're all poets, you know, yeah. sometimes. We're all artists. You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, even, uh, you know, and then poetry is a process, you know. It's not, um, Robert Frost has this thing, you know, where he talks about students coming up to him with half a written poem and wondering if it's worth figuring out the other half. And it's an impossible question to answer. You right. Know? You got to write it first. Sure. Um, but that does require faith. And there you have to have a faith that you're going to get get to something worth saying. Um, but I think that there's also an emphasis on the product uh, sometimes of poetry instead of just the process, which is to say, you know, maybe the, the poem you get at, you know, is was, you, you know, maybe the, the b- most valuable part of it was the writing of it, you know. Sure. And that's fine, too. Um and so, uh, I guess that would be my advice. Um, and, and the other part is, you know, once you get that, once you get that, find one buddy. Once you get that one buddy, accountability. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. One person. I mean, I just saw this one person so brave out there. Uh, had waiting. Well, she was waiting for friends who showed up just as as she got there. Um, but for a while, she was just standing there by herself, and nobody's making eye contact her, and she had full. Dia de los Muertes makeup on. Oh, okay. right. I think I saw who you're <laughs> talking you about. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. And while she's there by herself, she looks like a crazy person in the makeup. But sure. as soon as her friends come around, now she's a trendsetter. The strength you know, of numbers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you're by yourself, you're crazy. But if someone's with you, you're you're a leader. Yeah. So, so right. So uh, my, my my point would be go get that one person. And there are a lot. And Tucson's a great place to be a writer. Um, there's a lot of. Um, we just learned about one. Uh, I don't know if it's any good, but Kim recommended from one of my students, so I'm going to share it like it is because I trust my students. But uh, Wednesday night, Cartels has a Write, uh, write Wednesdays event, right? Where there's Cartels a, is that coffee shop? Yeah, it's a coffee shop downtown, I think it is. And uh, it's one of many. I mean, um, Antigone's always having them, uh, uh, and, and there there are plenty of others of, of open mics. The yeah. UA Poetry Center has them. And, uh, you know, um, another way is, you know, you know, come to Pima. We got we got creative writing classes. We got them online, and sometimes you just need that accountability. Sure. And you're on a tough schedule. Here's my pitch. My boss is gonna <laughs> me, come take classes online. Creative writing. <laughs> no, I think I think accountability is is a good idea, and I think that will help you kind of relieve the block. Because, um, I I know for myself, I, I I the power of the deadline is something that that I, I, I kind of need to have in order to that accountability to, to get words on paper. So I think that's a, that's yeah. a smart thing that you said. Yeah. But I mean, it's also, I mean, I like the, I like the powerlifting metaphors too, because you know, you, you have to push yourself to failure or you don't get stronger, you know? So right. when I'm working out, um, with my buddy Dave and, um, we're doing chest presses sometimes. And sometimes I'll say how many we're doing, you know, like three sets of 15, but sometimes it's like, well, you're going to do it until you cannot do it anymore. So that's, that's like, you know, and so, uh, you know, doing the thing and failing is part of it. It's a first attempt in learning. We're, we're always sure. a little afraid to fail in this country, but we do it all the time and it's, it's necessary. You actually, they do these psychology studies, just dipping into teacher mode a little bit Sure, about, please. uh, <laughs> um, 
if you're always succeeding, you're actually learning much less. If you fail right. the first time, you go back and you look at the material a lot more carefully. And so how we translate that into online is sometimes it's a lot better to put um, these quizzes where you can practice with no cost. And so you can see you know, how to remediate that yourself um, without necessarily destroying your grade. Anyway, this is supposed to be about poetry. No, that, 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 that carries over. That, that's helpful. Um, so, I guess so. Uh, I guess we're, we're. How are we doing on time here? I, I well, think we, we have enough time for. Want, yeah, oh, okay. I think. I, I'd like to wrap it up with, a, with at least one more poem, if that's sure. if that's okay. Yeah, we can do that. Um, this one. Uh, okay, so this one. I, I, I don't know what to call it. I call it "Embrace the Division." Someone, someone said last night that t- titles are hard, and most of the times I, I'm, I'm fine with it. This one's not so good. Uh, I think. Uh, but it's a poem that I started writing 20 years ago. Um, oh. Yeah. And uh, it was, <laughs> it's going to sound like a psycho. But yeah, I was looking in the mirror one time and I was having a staring contest with myself because I'm a kid and what are you going to do? Sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Jim Carrey goes, right. Doing that. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Um, but yeah, no. And I, and I, and I thought that I saw, like, my eyes got so tired that I thought I saw a different person, right? <laughs> So like I thought it was just I thought it was a little bit like my grandpa. So like I started to think of it as like me as like older me. Oh, okay. So like older me and younger me, which is a great poem to have as you get older because now I'm going to be writing to the the knucklehead staring into the mirror, right? right? Anyway, uh, and uh, for a long time I thought it was done, and then uh, I wanted to look at it again because. Uh, it, w- it gets to the point where I didn't want to read it to anyone, and if if it's there, then I either need to retire it or. Or attack it again, you yeah. know. And so I tried the the latter, and uh, this is what I came up with. <clears throat> Look there, in the mirror where my eye meets my eye. I see me, staring back at me. Again, again, infinity. When I stare there in the mirror's glare, tiny hairs of my eyelash dash against cold half-black glass. A cataract attacks, causes a schism in my peripheral vision. My face adopts a vicious disposition in possession of otherworldly obsessions and further inspections of this distorted perception beguile visual correction. Scholars unmentioned lead interventions, giving perplexing attentions but getting frenzied confessions as they found a palatable background for their most currently renowned to espouse theoretically profound sounds. All accounts report these semi-permanently confounded clowns were at least well-pronounced about what they found and ventured a guess about the rest, like what's beneath the crest of tears left from the blessed leap bereft, shedding not the red egress of death, but the quiet whispers from a poet's smoky breath. Light refracts fast, fast. Young man looks in, old man looks back. Wow, what a great flow. They're great. I love that machine gun, like, do, 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 do. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. I mean, we talked about a little bit last night about um, I started off as, like, an end rhyme poet, you know, um, but there's only there's only one pacing for that, and that's why the most common critique is don't do that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, that's, but, if, but that's not a pathway to fix the issue. So what worked for me was making internal rhymes, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of them. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, some, and, and, but there needs to be a pacing. So both beginning, the beginning of the poem, the end of the poem, sometimes within the poems, what I'm finding is, you know, especially if I'm like reading it in public, there's only so much of that an ear can take before it loses its mind. And right. so you got to be careful about when you're doing it and when you want your audience to f- stop following you. And then you bring it back to kind of more traditional verse. Hmm. I don't know. That yeah, worked out great. Yeah. I thanks, can't. dude. Very cool. Well, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And, and uh, I wanted to thank you very much for coming and, and, and joining me. And uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah.